by welcoming each and every one of you to the 2015 State of the District Address. Um, it's really an honor to have you all here, and of course, we're looking forward to hearing from this group here to my left. Um, we're excited to be here at the John Stanford Center. That's a change of venue from previous years. Uh, it is my last month on the Seattle School Board, and um, uh, I um, will miss this. And um, I'm as excited today about what's ahead as I was eight years ago when I was first elected to office. So. Um, with that, I want to pause momentarily and make a couple of introductions or acknowledgements. Um, I have a fellow board director, Betty Patu, here in the front. And uh, if Betty could stand. And um, Director Marty McLaren is here in the audience as well, so I'm pleased to have them here with me. Um, I'm not seeing any of the other directors or the directors elect. We have new directors coming in, so uh, we will look forward to welcoming them when they're here. We've accomplished a lot in Seattle Public Schools over the time that I have been here, and I'm, I'm optimistic, I'm excited for our families, for our staff, and for our students. Um, and there's a lot of good work to be accomplished in the days ahead. So with that, I would like to uh, welcome the John Rogers Otters Choir, and this group is uh, directed by Stephanie Trenier. So with that, um, I'm excited to turn it over to you and look forward to hearing what you are gonna present. enough to have. Um, these students are also my music students and they meet with me for choir once a week. So we've been working for about a month um, on this. Uh, it would be a total of about four choir practices. So we're pleased to present this to you tonight. Oh, and the students helped write the words. So they came up with their own dreams and hopes and they put them in the song. So the lyrics are from the students. Thank you so much for that. That was a terrific presentation. What we'd like to do is have each one of you, we'll pass the microphone around and have you each state your first name. So that way um, we all know who you are. So why don't, you know, I'm gonna depart from typical practice. I'm starting in the back row. Um, and would you tell us that you're, you're close to the Kibibon and there's some extra Hi, I'm Lynn. I'm one of the choir helpers here. I go to Jane Addams Middle School. I graduated from John Rogers. I am Taylor. I'm Quentin. I'm Harper. I'm Liliana. I'm 
Cynthia. I'm Greta. I am Peyton. Hello, I'm Cole. I'm Finnegan. I'm Angelica. I'm Trig. I'm Aiden Choirhopper. I'm Silencia. I'm Faith. I'm Anna. I'm Elena. I'm Jordan. I'm Georgia. I'm Maya. I'm Phoebe. I'm Adriana. I'm Nico. I'm Ben. I'm Olivia. I'm Joshua. I'm Alex. I'm Chloan. I'm Lauren. I'm Avery. <laughs> I'm Anaya. I'm Maria. <laughs> I'm Luca. I'm Andalus. And thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for the round of applause for our John Rogers Otters Choir under the direction of Stephanie Trenier. Thank you very much for being here, you guys. Well done. I'm going to go sneak in front of you here. <laughs> it's always fun to see our educators that are so passionate about educating our children. And I, um, at this time, as we're watching our students exit the room, I uh, would like to take the opportunity to introduce someone else who's very passionate about educating our children, and that's our superintendent, Dr. Larry Nyland. All right, the students are having cookies. All right. Well, welcome. Uh, it's my uh, privilege and pleasure to uh, provide the information on the state of the district, uh, finishing up my first year as superintendent, starting my second year as superintendent. Delighted to be back uh, in the city where I grew up and where I graduated. I believe that I'm the second superintendent in the history of uh, Seattle schools, a hundred and some odd years of being a homegrown uh, product of Seattle schools. Enjoying uh, reconnecting a little bit with uh, the local history, living in Belltown, not far from where my uh, grandfather came when he immigrated here uh, 120 years ago or something like that. So uh, delighted uh, to be uh, here in Seattle and be part of uh, a great school system. Uh, my uh, passion and pleasure is when I get to be in classrooms with uh, kids like we've had here tonight and seeing the good learning that uh, our educators are providing in, in our classrooms. Also, uh, an old, old, old social studies teacher, so uh, I, I like to think in terms of uh, kind of history and what's important, and so we live through a school year of 365 days or 180 days for students, and it's kind of like, whoa, that went by fast. Uh, and then, so just kind of taking stock at the really, really high levels, kind of looking back 10 years from now, what would we say about this last year? Uh, another year of enrollment growth, I think our seventh. Uh, encouraging student performance on a new, higher standard, tougher, uh, smarter balanced assessment. Implementation of wireless technology. We didn't know what it was a few years back, and now we can't live without it. Uh, significant improvements in special education and initiation of the Seattle uh, preschool program, uh, starting uh, many, many, many of our preschool students off on a great journey that will bring them to Seattle Public Schools uh, well and bet better prepared than uh, they might have been. Um, a quick look at who we are, uh, 52,000 students and growing. Uh, up 336 students, uh, not quite our typical trend of about 1,000 students per year that we've been seeing, but still uh, steady growth. 98 schools, uh, I've made it to every one of them now for at least uh, a round of visits uh, in the classrooms. Um, and a very diverse student body, 147 countries of origin, 135 languages, 37% uh, free and reduced lunch, 13% uh, ELL. Um, so, uh, a vibrant, growing, dynamic, diverse uh, school district. Well, <clears throat> today, I'd like to uh, take a look at uh, 
a theme of partnerships, uh, starting in uh, woven through my remarks and ending with this theme of partnerships and the idea that we can't do it alone, that we need uh, our full community and our community partners with us. And then we want to look at uh, some of the successes that we've had this last year and some of the challenges and opportunities uh, that lie ahead. We had an opportunity to do the uh, uh, one o'clock session today at City Hall, and the City of Seattle is certainly one of our premier partners. In addition to the uh, $750 million budget that you saw up there for the school district, the City of Seattle puts in another $34 million into school improvement efforts, and now another $14 million into the preschool program, and uh, do an excellent job of uh, investing in programs that make a difference for kids. Our strategic plan, uh, five-year strategic plan, you see these posters around every student, every classroom, every day, has three goals uh, to, with them. Excellence and uh, equity around the academic part. System-wide supports what we do here at the district level to make uh, school, uh, schools and school teachers successful. And then family and community engagement, how we uh, create opportunities for parents uh, and our community partners to be engaged uh, with us. So to touch on some successes in each one of those, I guess I'd stop for just a moment and say of our school board, our school board, uh, they spend countless hours. I mean, they, they spend, it's not quite a full-time job, but they spend the equivalent of sometimes 20 hours a week uh, on all of the work that they do. And part of that work is to keep asking us, how are we doing on the strategic plan? Annually, they set goals uh, called uh, board governance priorities, and then they set goals for uh, superintendent, SMART goals for whatever it is, specific, measurable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then they check back on those on a quarterly basis to say, how are we doing uh, on those goals? So I'm not going to be uh, literal about each and every one of those goals, but basically what I'm reporting on now are the goals that the board uh, gave to us as the staff to work on. So goal number one uh, is in that area of academics, uh, excellence and equity. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, we had the opportunity this last year to give the new Smarter Balance test. Created a lot of anxiety and a lot of uh, fear and trepidation in some places because A, it was a higher standard. It's college and career standard, not a 10th grade standard like the old test. And it had to be given on technology, which turned out to be a, a challenge for us, but one that we've stepped up to. And the people who invented the test said, you're going to see a huge drop in your scores. Uh, and uh, yeah, we were fearful about that. Thanks to the good preparation by our teachers and our principals, uh, we didn't see that huge drop. We saw a small drop, uh, but this uh, shows Washington State scores in the light color and Seattle scores in the dark color. Uh, this one's uh, reading and literacy, and we outperformed the state by eight percentage points. The next one shows math, and we outperformed the state by 10 points uh, in math, averaged over grades three through eight. So again, our teachers and principals have done an awesome job of preparing students for a new higher standard uh, test. Another part of goal one was uh, special education. Uh, we started last year uh, in uh, on a list from the federal government uh, saying that we were a level four school, which was not good. Uh, we were gauged to be uh, high risk uh, and uh, we were monitored by the state and the federal government on a quarterly basis last year. I just got uh, in the mail today uh, our rating uh, for this year, and we moved. We, we, we knew that we'd moved off of uh, level four, which was high risk. Uh, we knew that we'd moved to level three. I got the letter today saying we'd moved to level two. So uh, thanks to huge work by special education. <clears throat> They did, they did a 200 and some page uh, manual and they have worked on getting a better system in place to make sure that IEPs are kept current and up to date and being followed and that work is now uh, being uh, transferred uh, and translated into good work in the schools. So uh, great work by uh, special education. Some of the other indicators of uh, success in um, 
Oh, there it is. Um, along the wall over here, we have a board, a School of Distinction uh, banners from a year ago. Uh, and up here, we have 23 schools that have been identified by the State Board of Education as being in the top 5% of different categories, whether that's reading or math uh, or ELL or uh, maybe uh, improvement. Uh, so terribly proud of the good work that all of our schools are doing and many of them are being recognized at the highest level uh, in the state. Some of the other indications, uh, we have uh, eight of our schools that we've identified that are on this list year after year after year and we've gone out to them to find out what is it that you're doing that the rest of us uh, could learn from. Uh, three of those schools, uh, middle schools, uh, Mercer, Denny, and Aki, uh, have been at this work for 15 years. I think uh, Mercer has been on this list uh, eight years in a row. Uh, I think it's the only school in the state that's been on this uh, list for that long. Uh, and um, they uh, have done work with the uh, Neshome Foundation and with the city of Seattle, and they've been one of kind of that premier partner that helps us figure out what is it that they're doing that the rest of us want to learn from uh, and partner with. And so I think Mercer then uh, kind of invented some of that stuff and then tag teamed with Denny and Aki to, uh, to spread that. And we want to continue that, uh, that good work. So, goal two is how do we make those systems work uh, district-wide? And this has been a challenge for us. We've uh, had five, six, seven years of recession and we made budget cuts during that time. We tried to keep those cuts away from kids and so we made a lot of cuts at the district level. And sometimes that shows when we don't have the systems in place to do the things that uh, we need to have done. Some examples of things that we uh, have uh, worked on and, and made happen this last year. Uh, a year ago, we had, uh, I don't know, 40 plus uh, special ed vacancies uh, at the time that school started. So some of our neediest students and we didn't have teachers. So HR and special education teamed up. They worked with Seattle U, Seattle Pacific, University of Washington. They hired uh, 88 teachers early uh, before we had openings for them. And as a result, uh, they've had 97% of those positions filled uh, on day one. Technology, as I mentioned earlier, uh, actually set a goal to get wireless in every school by the end of the year, and I think they made it by December last year. Uh, and then they uh, went through the process of bringing in 3,000 new computers so that we would have enough, barely, computers for all of the students to uh, take the Smarter Balance test on computers. So. Somehow they figured out how to do that, get those computers ordered, purchased, uh, in the hands of uh, teachers, uh, opened out of the box and used by kids. And uh, then the other thing that we've done just recently is that if you've been looking at our website, you know that uh, it's made some fairly rapid transitions uh, between last uh, spring and this fall. We're still kind of working through some of those growing pains. Uh, but primary reason for doing that, well, several reasons, but uh, it's now ADA compliant for visually impaired. Uh, and uh, that was, uh, we're one of the first uh, K-12 systems in the nation to uh, make that move. And um, also uh, hopefully providing uh, better tools for parents and for teachers as well. And then uh, the legislature uh, continued to work on McCleary and they gave us uh, the equivalent of about 60 teachers one extra teacher for every elementary uh, school in the district. So uh, it's not a dramatic change in class size, but every teacher helps, uh, and it helps lower class size, and it meant that we had to find 60 new uh, classrooms. So uh, we're continuing uh, to address capacity issues as well. Goal three is family and community engagement. And uh, we worked on a 100-day uh, plan, which was how can we keep moving? And uh, every 30 days, we had another benchmark. The first, uh, one of the first benchmarks was customer service, training people in this building. Another benchmark was what are the top 10 questions that uh, parents might ask? And can we make a way for uh, it to be as easy as possible for parents to find that uh, information? 
uh, Peggy McAvoy uh, in the back here uh, has uh, helped uh, lead our, uh, up here in the front, uh, has helped lead our uh, work around bell times. Uh, this last year uh, we've had engagement of well over 10,000 people uh, in six rounds of community engagement trying to figure out how can we move bell times so that high school students can go to school later in the day when they've got a little bit more sleep and uh, a little bit more brain capacity. Uh, so uh, that work is nearing uh, uh, at least, a, I, I, I was going to say a conclusion, it's nearing a start uh, by getting to the point where the board will approve it at the next uh, board meeting and then we'll start the hard work of figuring out how to implement it for 2016. A lot, we heard a report last night uh, for the board on uh, our family engagement uh, process and the number of schools around the district that have been working to uh, implement uh, what we know about the research on family engagement. Uh, and John Hopkins has recognized that work uh, specifically at Hawthorne Elementary by uh, awarding them uh, national recognition. And then uh, in the partnership theme, a shout out to our PTSA uh, partners. Uh, our PTAs raise two and a half million dollars a year that goes into supporting our schools and more important than that is all of the volunteer time uh, and the help and the coordination and the uh, field days and uh, uh, all of the things that uh, PTAs uh, do with us. One of the other things that uh, the uh, president of the PTSA, Cassandra, has uh, set as a goal is to help us make sure that we uh, have fewer kids that go home hungry for the weekend. So we provide free and reduced lunch for students during uh, the week for those students that qualify, but they maybe go home on the weekend and don't have food. So uh, they've, I think they've uh, partnered with 15 additional schools to provide weekend backpacks uh, with uh, food for the weekend. So uh, another partner that we certainly couldn't, um, couldn't do without. So that's a, a summary of our three goals and our successes in those areas. And basically those were the goals that the board set for us a year ago. Well, it's a new year, so uh, we have new challenges, new opportunities, and we've worked with the board to set a new set of goals. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is the difference between a challenge and an opportunity is the amount of skill or resources available. Don't have a lot of resources, so it has to be on the skill side, and that's where uh, we have good staff and we have good partners. So we'll take a look at some of these uh, challenges that we uh, are working on this year. So again, goal one was uh, over here on equity and excellence, and in this case, uh, preparing every student for college, career, and life. Uh, and I think that's one that's taking a while to grow in grow on us uh, in terms of well, we don't oftentimes think of college being for everyone, but increasingly it is. Uh, Two-thirds of the new family wage jobs that our students will be competing for require some college. Not four years, maybe only one year, uh, but some college. Or if they're in a trade, uh, it requires the equivalent of some of the same kinds of skills. For the auto mechanic that has to plug in all of those computers that check all of those computers on my car and read the repair manual and figure out what it means when computer number whatever is not doing whatever it's supposed to do. So uh, some of the indicators that uh, we're making progress in this area, two thirds of our seniors uh, take and pass uh, a college level course before they graduate, meaning that they're already kind of one tiny step along the journey and hopefully uh, thinking along that way and ready to take that next step. Our freshmen, well, all of our students, they have to pass 24 credits in order to graduate. Well, I guess we have a waiver for one more year, but the state law is 24 credits, which we have a six period day, four years of high school, do the math. You have to pass every class in order to graduate. So if ninth graders come in and they goof off for just three weeks at the start of the uh, semester, first semester, and they get behind, they're in danger of failing, and if they fail uh, three of their classes, they're no longer on track to graduate. So this year, uh, we increased the number of freshmen on track to graduate uh, by 7%. Another one of the, uh, what do they call these, uh, trend benders, 
uh, early indicators uh, is eighth grade algebra. Uh, for students who are, are going to graduate on time, uh, one of the first markers is third grade reading. Uh, one of the next markers is eighth grade algebra. Uh, we now have about half of our students who are uh, taking and passing uh, algebra in eighth grade. And then the number of uh, college-bound scholarship sign-ups sign is on the increase, and we have uh, well, college access now uh, here tonight. So uh, thanks for uh, that support and partnership. And then uh, one of our partners that will come up at the end of uh, our, our very ending slide, we won't go there right at the moment, is uh, Seattle, Univer Seattle uh, Colleges. Uh, and Seattle Colleges has provided this incredible gift of uh, 13th year promise scholarships for uh, our needy students in the south part of the district. So an incentive for a student that if they uh, stay in school, graduate on time, they know that they'll get one free year of college tuition. So uh, hundreds of students have had that opportunity uh, because of that partnership and that fundraising that uh, the Seattle College Foundation uh, has done. So another one of those partners that we couldn't, uh, couldn't do without. That's half the story. Uh, the trend line for uh, all of our students has been positive and upward. And as I mentioned, we're doing uh, better than expected on a higher college uh, standard and we're making a lot of uh, gain. The other half uh, is the opportunity gap, is that not all of our students are benefiting from uh, the hard work uh, that's uh, been going into the system. So uh, African-American, East African students proficient at 30% in uh, language arts, grades three through eight, uh, white students proficient at 77%, a huge gap. Uh, the next slide, shows that, uh, again, it shows the positive trend line. And actually, this particular slide shows that the gap has narrowed a tiny bit uh, over that uh, time period. But the top two lines are uh, students who are not of color, students who are not of color uh, and middle income, students not of color uh, and low income. So uh, poverty matters. And then uh, the bottom two lines are students of color who are middle uh, income and low income. And again, uh, income matters uh, and uh, race matters. So this is one of, one of the reasons why I'm passionate about being here in Seattle. And one of the reasons I came back out of retirement is that this is the work that we have to do for our future. Uh, not only for the future of our students, but for the future of our country. Uh, half of our students nationally are now of color, and half of our students nationally uh, qualify for free and reduced lunch. So if we can't figure out uh, how to make a difference for each and every student, including uh, students of color and students uh, that come from uh, homes that uh, don't have as much wherewithal, uh, our communities uh, will not have that positive future that we uh, certainly hope and that the children just sang about here. So. Uh, so what are we doing about that? Well, uh, <clears throat> got to find my notes here. We're doing uh, a, a lot of things about that. Uh, first and foremost, uh, for the last two years, uh, Michael uh, Tolley, Associate Superintendent for Teaching and Learning, has been uh, leading our effort to uh, daylight this kind of data and uh, share it with principals. And then we've asked principals to work with their staff to set goals around groups of students that uh, would be in one of those categories and not necessarily, not on that one yet, uh, would not necessarily, uh, uh, yeah, would not benefit from the things that we're doing. So uh, we're trying to take an inquiry approach and find out from the eight schools that I mentioned that are uh, showing the way, lighting the way, and from our own work, uh, what will begin to work. And we have uh, research partners from uh, University of Washington and Seattle University that are helping study that with us to say, let's, let's document that and find out uh, what works. Um, some of the other things that we have uh, underway is, um, I uh, called out earlier today, uh, Dwayne Chappelle, uh, principal from uh, Rainier Beach, who will soon be moving to the city as the new director of, uh, um, yeah, D, Director for Education and Early Learning, D-E-E-L. 
Uh, and uh, the, they've transformed uh, Rainier Beach uh, through this focus on international baccalaureate for each and every student, setting a high expectation, a high standard, and then uh, identifying students by name and need to say, what can we do to close gaps for each and every student? And by doing that, they raised their graduation rate uh, by 25%, uh, and they have some incredible stories to tell about students that seemingly had little, uh, little hope of a bright future because of terrible trauma, injuries, uh, family deaths, other issues, uh, and because a teacher or the principal singled them out, checked in with them on a daily basis, kept telling them, you can do it. I know you can take that IB class. We'll find one that you like and we'll engage you in that. And out of that comes that confidence for, wow, I passed that class. I guess I can do this work. I'll sign up for, uh, for the next one. So uh, we've got a lot, of, uh, a lot of examples about how we're uh, trying to close uh, this gap. The uh, next slide uh, points uh, uh, another variation on this is that uh, differential or disproportional discipline uh, is uh, a concern for us as part of the opportunity gap as well. This is a bar for uh, black students, uh, rates of suspension, suspended state, 8.6%, 8% in uh, Seattle. And then uh, for students as a whole, 3.9% of students suspended at the state level, 3.2% at the district level. Black students almost three times as likely as white students to be suspended. Uh, and that means that they're out of school, they're missing class, they're missing learning, they have learning, uh, uh, they're, they're, they have gaps that uh, make it more difficult to catch up. Uh, and we know that that's a, a negative trend line for students. So the, the school board, uh, has set a moratorium on elementary suspensions with uh, the idea that we would continue to move that up over time to middle and high school. We'll still suspend students for violence, uh, but for nonviolent uh, subjective offenses, we would find alternatives to that. Uh, so we've got some creative ways to provide short-term alternatives uh, for schools that uh, are trying to adjust to the new concept and the new uh, uh, way of working with students. And then uh, we've invested, uh, I don't know, about $400,000 in extending RULER, a uh, social emotional uh, program for students, uh, into almost every elementary school. Walked off without my prop. Uh, you may have seen it if you've been in one of the elementary schools. It's got uh, a colorful mood meter. There we go. Uh, that looks like this, a bigger version. I see a student up here nodding her head, yes. Uh, and you can guess, red is kind of, hmm, I'm not, I'm feeling a little bit angry today. And blue is, hmm, I'm feeling a little sad today. And uh, so teachers will ask students that. They may ask them to put up magnets or uh, little clothespins or something to show where they are for the day. And then they might put them on a rug and say, okay, uh, how might you talk yourself out of the red zone for today? Or, you know, what could we do to help talk you out of the blue zone? Um, one of the stories that uh, Kelly Aramaki, one of our uh, uh, ed directors, uh, tells about one of our schools was about a, a kindergarten teacher uh, taking a, a group of students to lunch and kids are lining up and the little guy's just, he's mad about something and he's getting into it and he's about ready to have a meltdown. Uh, and the teacher, uh, instead of, uh, you know, kind of jerking a hand, say, get in line, come with me or else kind of thing, uh, uses this, uh, um, this concept uh, and language and uh, tells a little guy, uh, hmm, can you think of anything that might get you out of the red zone? No. And so then she asks the other kids, can you think of anything that might help this little guy out of the red zone? He's kind of like, well, you could sing and dance. Do you want to sing and dance? No. Uh, other kids, anybody want to sing and dance? Some of the other kids start to sing and dance and pretty soon he cracks a little bit of a smile and she goes through some other spots and says, okay, are you ready to go to lunch now? So 30 seconds, 60 seconds, maybe two minutes that made a huge difference for the uh, learning climate for that class and certainly for this little guy. So instead of being a discipline offense that might have been one step toward uh, a bigger discipline, 
uh, all, of the school, all of the kids learned some new skills uh, and they went off to lunch and had a, had a good lunch and it didn't uh, erupt into something bigger uh, on the playground. So we'll continue to work uh, on this uh, issue as well. So uh, goal number two, back to those school supports and systems. Uh, so as I said, uh, we're uh, shorthanded at the district level, but uh, we're still making progress on certain uh, areas. Uh, Bell Times is one of those, so I've said quite a bit about that. We're moving forward on that. ELL, uh, Veronica is here. Uh, we had uh, ELL programs in about 65 of our schools last year and uh, have now expanded that to all 98 of our schools. And uh, so that's a, a, a heavy lift for our ELL department, for our teachers across uh, the district, but making those opportunities available to students uh, wherever uh, their home school is. A year ago, we had uh, issues around uh, Title IX, uh, field trips, uh, a $700,000 settlement. Uh, Dr. Charles Wright has uh, headed up a task force of Title IX parents and uh, community members. Uh, and they have made some great recommendations. They have some uh, great materials that are ready to go home uh, pretty soon in the next few weeks uh, to parents. Uh, we've been training uh, staff, administrative staff, over the last year. And we've just hired uh, a, a team of people here at the district office uh, to lift up that work and to make sure that we're uh, being more proactive about teaching uh, kids uh, and adults about what's acceptable and not acceptable around harassment, intimidation, bullying, and sex harassment. Technology, I've mentioned, uh, well, I mentioned the good work that was done last year. Last year, they bought 3,000 computers, and we said, good job. Uh, this year, the board just approved last night, uh, I think it's 6,000 computers that are going in over the next uh, 18 months. So uh, they've got another heavy lift uh, ahead of them, uh, and we appreciate their work. And then um, we have two levies coming up, February 9th, I think it is. Uh, our m and levy, maintenance and operation, which provides 25% of all of the funds that we use on a daily basis in the school day. And then the BTA levy, which uh, pays for buildings, either remodels or uh, buildings that uh, we would be adding capacity with. Um, and athletics and, and academics. So those, uh, those are coming up. And another one of our huge uh, partners is uh, our levy committee that goes out in the community and does all of that promotional stuff that we can't do as a, a public entity. So another great partner that uh, works with us in making that happen. So uh, the flip side, uh, I guess this would be more on the opportunity. Well, I guess it's still an opportunity. Uh, it's on the challenge side. These are things that we aren't getting done, which are terribly frustrating to me uh, in that uh, hmm. Seattle is uh, extremely blessed. Our levies are higher uh, in terms of benefits to our students than our surrounding communities by a little bit. Uh, we get this great support from the city and we have all of these great partners. And for me, coming into Seattle, it's kind of like, wow, we have got a lot of resources. We've got a lot of things working for us. But as I go around the community, everywhere I go, it's kind of like, we just need a million dollars more for this, or two million for that, or four million for this. So I won't take time to go through this, but this is just the list that comes kind of the top of my mind from recent uh, visits from people, and it totals $80 million, which would be another 10% on our budget. So. We do know that Washington is one of the least generous states in the nation for funding of education. And we know that under McCleary, uh, our legislature is charged with uh, doing better. And they have been. And they've been sending resources our way. But there's still all too many times when we have to say no, uh, when we really would like to say uh, yes. Uh, so we won't dwell on that a lot. It is what it is. We'll keep hoping for our legislatures to, legislators to uh, do well and uh, send more money our way to do good things for kids. Goal three uh, is uh, one of those areas that uh, is huge for us in terms of uh, a big need. So we need to keep working on our customer focus. Uh, we are, uh, have made some transitions in the website and we have more improvements to come in that area. 
Uh, looking for uh, parents to sign up uh, with us as uh, key communicators to help be in the know and then share uh, some of the good news. So that's one of my challenges and opportunities in Seattle in that I get to visit those schools on a regular weekly basis and I'm just in awe of the good work that our educators are doing. Uh, and then because we have 100 schools and in any given week, one of them may be in the news for something that's not as positive. Uh, a lot of our stories that show up in the newspaper are stories about the latest uh, challenge or uh, concern rather than the good things that are happening uh, each day in the classroom. And I think, because I'm long-winded, we took the slide out. Uh, but one of our slides uh, asked parents, uh, are, they, are, are they happy with the education that their child is getting? And I think it's 70 some percent of our parents are saying, yes, I, I, you know, I don't know about all those other schools in Seattle, but my school is pretty good. Uh, so we have work to do uh, in that area. And then I think the, the changing perceptions one is uh, becoming more apparent to us is that we've got to figure out uh, more and better ways to engage and involve our community. Uh, so uh, in the case of bell times, uh, we've done uh, a lot. Uh, and at the same time as we near the end of the uh, process, we still have people saying, ah, there's got to be one more step in the process. Uh, so no matter how much we do, it never seems to be enough. So we need to, in that case, we've done a lot. And maybe we need to figure out how to say enough is enough. Uh, in other cases, uh, we haven't done enough. Uh, and we need to get better at being smarter about putting those issues out before the public, before they become uh, a major source of concern to build uh, the transparency and the confidence uh, of our parents. So that's one that we, uh, we've got a lot of work to do uh, uh, this, this coming year. So that brings us kind of back to the main theme uh, that I wanted to highlight at least a few times as we went through the presentation, and that has to do with our uh, community partnerships. And uh, we have uh, more than a thousand uh, community partnerships, uh, and so they're all important, and uh, we love the work that our partners uh, do for us and for our students. I want to highlight just one of those tonight. Uh, Seattle University has been uh, one of those premier partners. Five years ago, they decided that they wanted to make a major impact uh, in the downtown area where they're uh, located. And they came to us and they said, how can we uh, partner with you in supporting students? And uh, internally, uh, spread their work not only in the School of Education, but throughout the campus to say, how do we provide uh, community service opportunities for all of our students to engage in social justice work uh, in our own uh, community? So uh, we're going to see a, a, a brief video about the good work that uh, Seattle University has been doing with Bailey Gatzert uh, Elementary and um, Washington Middle School and uh, Garfield uh, High School. So uh, as you watch the video, uh, take a look at the Seattle U students and uh, how they're engaging with the Bailey Gatzert students. Families come uh, in uh, from high poverty situations, so uh, they have those kind of obstacles to learning and uh, obstacles to uh, success in their lives. So it's this uh, two hours of, uh, of programming after school, so we're really extending the school day through this extended learning program with Seattle University, so the college students are coming over. Um, they're able to develop relationships with the kids. What, what are you coloring? They were really looking for service learning opportunities for their students. You divided by two. No, no. And I was looking for um, support for the families and for the students so they can be successful and model citizens themselves.
have come together as a community to really gather those resources. One of the greatest challenges was, you know, making a place that really just went beyond just the academics and really created kind of like a hub to learn that there are further resources that the families can get connected to. Oh, or look, you found two matching, that's right. You know, to support their children academically. And it's, this is really about equity and equality in terms of what we want for all of our kids. So for us, we are um, an institution committed to social justice and we want our students to learn about how to com combat issues of injustice. That's how you know that you've gotten all of the factors. And the only way for them to do that is to have experiences in the community to affect change. And so it's, this is about reciprocity in terms of our campus providing some things, but also for the, the community um, helping to, ins to be instructors and professors for our students. There's really their social emotional growth, which we've really seen accelerate this year, but also the um, absentee rate has um, improved, tardies have uh, latencies um, have improved, and I think that the kids are uh, really ready, much more ready for success. We know we can move them on to middle school and high school and hopefully college and they can really be successful citizens. My pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Kent Koth from Seattle University, who's going to share a few of their uh, thoughts, successes, and excitement about working with the students at Bailey Gatzert. Thank you, Dr. Nyland. I want to thank Seattle Public Schools, <clears throat> and pardon me, I'm just getting over a cold. I have a, a kindergartner and a fourth grader at home, and I think sometimes we we encounter what they encounter. So, um, I want to thank Seattle Public Schools uh, for partnering with the university. As shared in the video, it really is about a reciprocal relationship where our students and our faculty have an opportunity to learn and engage, and we hope that we can be of, of service in the community. In his new book entitled Our Kids, acclaimed Harvard sociologist Robert Putnam presents a deeply troubling thesis, the American dream of equality of opportunity is almost gone. Putnam documents that today, perhaps more than any point in the last 100 years, a child's socioeconomic status is the primary determinant whether, of whether they will succeed in school and progress on to college. In short, if you are low income in, the, in America today, the deck is stacked against you from the day that you were born. In exploring possible solutions to the crisis, Putman clearly notes the, the importance of public schools and schooling in, uh, in addressing the educational ga opportunity gap, but he also comments that schools can't do it alone. We all need to be involved in many different uh, facets of our society and need to support kids in schools. Recognizing this, in 2011, Seattle University launched what we call the Seattle University Youth Initiative which is a partnership with the school district, with the city of Seattle, with Seattle Housing Authority, and with dozens of community partner organizations and with parents and kids to focus on a 100 square block radius of the city just south of our campus, which encompasses most of, if not all, of the Gatsert attendance zone for Bailey Gatsert School. And um, we're focusing on the academic achievement of kids in those schools and their success in progressing on to college if they choose to. A central component of the youth initiative are partnerships with the public schools of Bailey Gatsert Elementary School, Washington Middle School, Garfield High School, and Middle College High School, which is housed on our campus. And this evening, I'd like to spend just a moment to describe the partnership with Bailey Gatsert in a little bit um, more depth. We've particularly appreciated the working with uh, Gatsert School because they have uh, a vibrant teaching staff, a terrific academic leader, a strong group of uh, parents and a very vibrant group of kids. And I've particularly enjoyed working with Greg Immel, the principal at Gatsert. Um, and one example of his leadership and leading in a culturally competent way was when, he, when Greg became principal in 2009, he suspended the use of suspensions at the elementary school. And so since 2009, there have been no suspensions in the school. And I'm thankful for his leadership. Yet Greg and the Gatsert community cannot 
do the work that they need to do alone because they face many challenges. The school has the highest rate of poverty of any school in Seattle. There are 20 different languages spoken at Gatsard Elementary School. And on any given day, as the video showed, there's 50 to 70 kids who are, who are homeless out of a population, school population of 320. Seattle University's partnerships with, Gatsert, with the Gatsert community include supporting the new preschool classroom at the school, expanding summer learning opportunities, increasing the use of technology, particularly by creating a state-of-the-art computer lab, supporting parent-led programs and parent-child events, and also advocacy eff efforts on the, um, that parents are interested in, partnering in the areas of student health, particularly mental health, and assisting Gatsert staff in developing a new data tracking system to monitor the student's academic progress. The centerpiece of the university's partnership, which was featured in the video, is the Gatsert Elementary School's extended learning program. Led by a full-time Seattle University staff person who is, who is housed in the Gatsert uh, School building, Gatsert teachers and five local nonprofits and, and uh, Seattle University students and staff have developed an after-school program which extends the learning day for half the kids in the school, 150 kids, by two hours from Monday through Thursday. Every week, over 100 Seattle University students and faculty and staff provide one-to-one -one academic support, lead enrichment activities, and, such as filmmaking, an engineering club, a running program, and a dance class. And last year, the after-school program which did, didn't exist prior to 2010, contributed 25,000 hours of additional learning for kids at Gatsert. Well, it's, if, if my faculty colleagues were here, they would be quick to point out that it's hard to, sh to show cause and effect. And in this case, it is hard to show cause and effect, but there are some very promising things occurring at Gatsert. In 2011, 2012, the first full year of the university community uh, Gatsert partnership, Gatsert elementary school students showed the greatest academic growth of any school in the district. And in 2014, Gatsert ELL students were in the top 5% for year upon year academic growth. Now a limitation of Seattle University's work in, in the city is that we're, we're focused on a fairly narrow geographic region in the city. 100 square blocks is a, is a, it seems like it's a lot, but it's a very small portion of our city. And so I'm thankful that there are some other promising efforts in the area of of partnerships. The city's uh, family and education levy and its new preschool program are offering resources that are very vitally needed for our schools and our um, families. And I, I think um, most noteworthy, the slide that you showed at the end, which shows some of the partners in the city, there are hundreds and hundreds of different organizations that are looking to partner with our schools, many of them that have been partnering for many years. And the, the school district has recently re-envisioned the school and community partnership depart department here to better support the alignment of those programs so they can have the most impact. Seattle Public Schools is also partnering on new and innovative strategies in the area of family engagement in order that all families, particularly families from low income uh, backgrounds, can engage in their, school, in their children's school and in their child's education. Seattle Housing Authority and Seattle Public Schools are partnering on a, on, to focus on the children who live in public housing in, in Seattle and go to Seattle schools. One out of every eight children in our school system, in our public school system, live in, in public housing. And there's um, some significant work that can occur in looking at where do those children live and then how to um, we connect both where they live and where they go to school. And finally, the Seattle Council of PTSA has done tremendous work, as described earlier, in terms of the backpack project, but also the advocacy at the state level for better funding of our public schools. I think we all recognize that that would uh, have a significant impact. There's much more to do. There's much more that Seattle University will be involved in. This is a, this is a permanent commitment that the university has made to be involved in our city. Um, and I, I guess I have a belief that all together with all of our partnerships and strategies that we can pursue a vision where every child in Seattle are our kids and together um, we'll have a much stronger educational system for all. Thank you.
Thank you, Kent. You can see why they're one of our great uh, partners, and uh, we'd love to have each and every one of you and uh, many more uh, join us. Well, uh, one more piece uh, to do to this evening, and uh, I think it will be the highlight of your evening here. Uh, Leigh Jafar is a student at Cleveland. Uh, she's uh, Seattle's first ever youth poet laureate. And uh, she has uh, a very appropriate and uh, touching uh, message for us that will resonate with some of the things that you've seen and heard here. Uh, but uh, probably more importantly, a message from the heart. So, Leja, welcome. Hello. Um, that's funny looking at a picture of my school. Um, so yeah, like he said, I attend Cleveland High School. I'm a senior this year, so I'm excited to be done. Um, <laughs> and this poem is actually about um, just being in school and being an African-American female um, in classroom, seeing African-American males um, who feel like maybe they struggle to have their voice heard. Um, when it comes to education. So this is basically telling them to stay strong and keep your head up. Delicate black boy. Soldier, plum painted spirit, deep rooted dreamer. I can tell from the oceans on your bed that you've never been told you were beautiful. Mother didn't remind you of rainbows in her malleable inside. She soaked you in songs, but never self-love, never explained the pink hue of your lips or the mold that marked your spine. You later saw mirrors and didn't memorize the letters of beauty so you couldn't recite them. You didn't know your magic, that lovemaking on the Sunday was your conception and no one could dismiss that you had a shine oozing from your collarbone when you were born at 6 a.m. You glow in the dark. You are a poem. Boys can be roses. Boys have hearts. They need love. You have amputated your stomach for relief from the world, relief from what they feed you. That black boys don't need love, only bullets. That they'll find warmth in a barrel before they can bear a reflection. They lie to you. Black boys bleed every month. They are left with miles of blood clot, the hymns of their brothers. They leak the blood of the murder, the red liquid that drowns concrete, drowns tomorrow, drowns the pigment of their skin. You are a black boy that sheds. Finding yourself in these science experiments with your flesh, not trying to be heartless, not wanting to be in pain any longer, wanting to be told you are flawless, you are a work of art. Standing in the light so it can reveal the shades of magic, your blood, the shades of black boy beautiful that paint the world, but you were never told that you are acrylic and you are unique, something that takes time to love, something that takes time to believe in. Your mother should have whispered in her pregnancy to you. She should have put you to bed with the words that hold off revolutions. Beauty would stop the war. Women are not the only ones that need to know their value. These TVs and politics won't deny them of hearts they love, no matter what. Delicate black boy, you bleed every month. Your ribs leak the sea of last night's massacre. The next night, your legs will drip and stain like an unattended sharpie. You will crust at the edges of your hips, tattoo at the angles of your chin with those stories. You go through pain, too. You do not birth humans, but you birth the world. Every single day, you wake up, I tell you, in a place that will never understand you are amazing in a place that will put fire to you, then say you are callous, they will burn you, then say you are reckless. Some others won't tell you because they think it is feminine and they want to prepare you for a battlefield your whole life, but I tell you, you are beautiful, you are grand, you are too permanent to be unloved. You will heal this place when it is full of scars, full of scabs, full of stitches, you will be the one to erase the pain. Beauty is the tongue you will learn to speak. Pass this to the young brother on the corner who's been told his body is a mixture of oil and water. Pass it to every brother, delicate black boys, soldiers. Beauty is a tongue 
you will learn to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Farr, for that incredible presentation. That brings us to the bottom of our agenda, and uh, I'm here to close the event, and I will do that by saying thank you to our community partners on behalf of the school board. Thank you for those of you um, that do this work with us each and every day, um, and thank you to each of you for coming down here tonight and uh, hearing our story, and we look forward to seeing you next year. Good evening. <laughs>